Ông quay chụp Ông nhầm rẻ bác cảm to Các chúng ta cần đến tiếp vì xa mạng ca Thì nâng đó là vì chúng ta chuyển từ Cộng mê dư vi ca phía đây lục nôn chi Rồi mấy bác to ca tăng phần lốt đánh đào Nhiệm phố nét chùm đình Xong chơi Thank you, Mr. President. Um, Mr. Professor Chandler, before the break, we were speaking about the American bombardments, and you have provided some information with regard to these bombardments. Um, but in your brother number one book, you uh, state, and I am happy to put it on the screen, but I We'll try if I can just quote the language and you can respond to it. Uh, the bombing campaign's effect on rural, rural society is difficult to judge, but in view of the tonnage involved in Cambodia's unpreparedness, it must have been catastrophic. And then you, uh, well, let me first ask you to response to that, what, um, would you say, if you were asked about the effects of the bombing on Cambodia's rural society? Well, that, uh, that sentence, of course, uh, which I stand, I stand by in the sense that I stand by what I wrote in uh, 1991. Now, since that time, I've come back to Cambodia many times, and I'm sure the effect of the bombing in rural areas, in many rural areas, was indeed catastrophic. But it doesn't seem to feature as much as one might have thought it would in all the many of the survivor statements and witness statements at the court and other things. It looks to me as if a lot of the tonnage was not dropped intentionally on, on unpopulated areas, but did fall on unpopulated areas. We read in many of the uh, reports about the uh, punishment centers around the uh, country, a lot of times victims were thrown into B-52 craters, which were dotted the countryside. Um, yeah, I mean, <laughs> I think I would still stick by that sentence, but I want to say that you know, there's 20 more years of people being able to say, come forward and say, this is the worst thing that happened. And that they haven't come forward to say that, not, which isn't to say that occasionally, or maybe even often, uh, villages were destroyed. I think a, a primary effect of this bombing uh, was the uh, first exodus from the countryside, especially around Phnom Penh, into Phnom Penh, for uh, take refuge. You look at the map of the bombing that was before this increased tonnage figure was available in uh, Shawcross's book, uh, Sideshow. <coughs> it's a ring of fire around the capital. It's around provinces around the capital. Uh, obviously, we've thrown people into the city, I would think, rather than families into the revolution, uh, certainly some young men, uh, either enraged by the bombardment or for other reasons, joined the Khmer Rouge at this time, but we don't have the precise evidence of the quantity of these recruits at that time, or that this might be a result of the bombing. Sorry, I'm sorry, sorry to interrupt you, and I well, please truly find it very fascinating, uh, the things you're saying here today, and also, by the way, the things you've written in all your books. Um, but time is short, so um, I sometimes have to interrupt, and uh, you actually have touched on the next topic that I wanted to ask uh, a question on. And that was the, uh, as you called it, the, the forced exodus of people from the countryside. It's, it's a matter of words, but would you agree, uh, Professor Chandler, that the, uh, the bombing, in that sense, created um, a stream of refugees that were uh, fleeing towards Phnom Penh and into Phnom Penh? Certainly. There's a brief answer for you. <laughs> and do, you do you have an estimate as to the uh, number of refugees that had fled um, to Phnom Penh by um, 
Uh, from nearby provinces fleeing the bombing, but I'm not able to say what kind of percentage this might be. There's never been any work on this kind of data. And are you um, able to tell us something about the living conditions in Phnom Penh in April 19? 75 and that leads me um, into the next topic, and that is the evacuation of Phnom Penh um, after the DK forces moved into the city. And um, you have stated last week on um, July 19th on the transcripts, pages 73 to 75, and I quote, when they were approached by outsiders, they often came up with other reasons, which I think were also valid. There's a bunch of reasons. I'm not saying that the shortage of food was bad or the fear of an American attack. There's lots of ones that were mentioned. End of quote. And to be clear for the people that are attending these proceedings today, um, and that were not present last week, we're talking about the um, reasons the leadership of the DK regime gave for the evacuation of Phnom Penh. So you state that you're not saying that the shortage of food was bad or the fear of an American attack. And I would like to focus just for now on that last point, the fear for an American attack. You're saying that you're not saying that the fear of an American attack was, a, uh, was not a valid reason. Could you expand on that a little bit? Yeah, I think, I don't think, it's, it's, it's an explanation that may have been given and what seemed to have been given at the time to some uh, people in the city, but the Americans had gone. And we're not going to come back. I think uh, the regime may have known that. When the decision was made uh, to evacuate the cities in February 1975, as we've seen, uh, this uh, was never given as one of the main reasons. It seems to be the city had to be evacuated for reasons uh, that the regime uh, decided on, backed up by uh, practical points that make it uh, seem uh, more humanitarian. But there really wasn't food in the city to feed these two million people unless they took um, outside aid, which they refused to do. Uh, and it was a war t wartime situation, and they had built up a, as I said, a huge reservoir of hatred of city people among their own followers. But I think the American, uh, renewed American raids, uh, and I don't have access to the thinking of American regime at this time, but I think I can say with pretty much assurance there was no plan to bomb Phnom Penh uh, at the event of, uh, in, after the Khmer Rouge victory. Certainly no documents have ever served, serviced that anything like that as a no, no. policy procedure. Uh, I uh, don't mean for you to speculate on the American intentions. Uh, um, but speaking about this food situation that you referenced and you stated there was not enough food to be eaten in Phnom Penh, 
In your book, a, a History of Cambodia, you uh, state, and we have looked at the passage last week, so I, uh, if we can just quote in that book, and I'm, I'm very happy to provide a hard copy to you and provide on the screen, but for now, let me read the quotes, and the quote is, conditions were severe, particularly for those unaccustomed to physical labor, but because in most districts there was enough to eat, many survivors of decay who had been evacuated from Phnom Penh came to look back on these months as a compar comparative golden age. And of quote, and this speaks about the people that were evacuated from Phnom Penh to the countryside. And um, you write in this passage that in most districts there was enough to eat at that time. Could you elaborate briefly on this comment? Only in the sense that I assume uh, the people I spoke to that other people I spoke to were telling the truth. I don't think you can invent a, a, a pleasant period of your past. It was unpleasant. They'd say so. They went to the countryside and there was enough to eat. Not very much. They complained that it was not really enough. It was certainly not starvation and certainly not the kind of uh, terrible restrictions that many of them had enjoyed en route to their destinations, to their perhaps villages where relatives lived or whatever, um, you know, a countryside that did have uh, some rice stored. This was not a uh, harvest season. There was not a lot in storage, but they felt many of the survivors in this testimony we have felt that these first few months were not as bad as the exodus itself, and if they were people who were later relocated into the northwest particularly, it was not as bad as what followed. Thank you. And then, if we look at that period after the evacuation, and we are... Um, I would like to discuss a uh, conference that that is lead took place on May 20, 1975. And I'm mentioning this conference because our colleague for the civil parties last Friday asked you um, some questions relating to this conference. I am not sure if you were listening to the English translation, but in the English translation, it was made to appear that um, in this conference, certain decisions were adopted and that um, the civil party lawyer asked you to confirm whether these decisions were in conformity with Khmer Rouge policies. I want to make clear for the record that um, the document we were looking at, document 4.26, is actually a um, Ben Kiernan. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a passage from Ben Kiernan's book. Um, and I, um, it's the book, The Pol Pot Regime, and it's not actually a document, a DK-era document that was discussed. So I, uh, first of all, would like to want to make that clear to make sure that we, you know that we're not talking about a DK-era document. Professor Chandler, based on your research, do you know uh, which meeting is meant when we are talking about the uh, May 20, 1975 conference? I don't think I've referred to it. I think uh, Ben Kiernan, when he did his research, was told this information by people who had been at the meeting. He had never saw any documents, so I would have to be reporting third hand. I don't, I'm not sure that I referred to this meeting. I think it's, I'm not, I'm pretty sure that what he found out from the people who had been there was accurate. I don't think there any reason for them to make it up, but as you, I, I confirm it's certainly not a document from the Khmer Rouge period that, that has survived. Thank you. 
Indeed, um, Professor Chandler, I think Lord Kiernan Tam, but, uh, himself Lord states ben in his book on uh, ERN 0104 it's English ERN, that, and I quote, no documents and very few members of his audience appear to have survived, and of quote to that is consistent with you uh, just told me. Could you, from memory, and I understand you have not prepared for this, but could you name any of those persons in the audience that may have attended this meeting? มีประมาณเนี่ยได้ลูกบันเคนันบานประเทศให้หนึ่งสัวนู้นคืนยัยพิงเงะประชุมไงมีไพอุสเพียชนามปอมรัยชัดสุปรามอาคือสแตนด์
Sulek Matak and Longoret and uh, some of these other people, uh, Lono's brother uh, and so on, were uh, executed at the spot, and this has come up in, uh, in, in open reports. Uh, directions uh, have been also survived in uh, documents saying that certainly high-ranking military officials, I think, probably going, uh, I, I may be an exact here, but I think including all the commissioned officers, uh, would be smashed. And <coughs> obviously, as this was happening, people who belonged at all in the chaotic expression, uh, exp uh, the chaotic conditions of April 75, uh, some of these people did not draw the line between a commissioned officer and a, and a uh, non commissioned officer. I think uh, uh, the evidence is unclear, but very, let me look at it this way very few senior officers of the Khmer of the Lonnol Army are known to have survived and be among the refugees in other countries. If you have, but they had to be extremely adroit to escape uh, notice and uh, assassination. Thank you for that um, clarification. I would like to read to you uh, a quote from the Ben Kiernan article, and we um, can produce it on the screen. It is the document that was uh, used by the civil parties um, last week on Friday, and we saw the um, Khmer version on the screen. Um, I would like the professor, for obvious reasons, to um, read the English version. So I would like to hand the professor a hard copy and the document that I want to display is document number IS 4.26. It has been used by civil parties on Friday, and it's actually been um, mentioned on the prosecution list for documents to be admitted, to be admitted for um, trial. So with your permission, I would like to show an excerpt of a Ben Kiernan's book, The Pol Pot Regime, um, on page 57. And shall I hand a hard copy to the uh, professor? It's in English. It's the actual book by Ben Kiernan. Uh, so so it might be easier for the professor to uh, read. Look, Ben Kiernan, the way look, Ben Ann, so much yet look to him. And I'm not going through the entirety of that page, but let me, um, before I actually read the full quote, summarize what's on the uh, left page, which is page 56. On that page, Ben Kiernan writes that, uh, indeed, Chia Sim confirms Sin Song's list, and Chia Sim allegedly added in that interview this was a very important order to kill. GSM also states that it was Min who spoke these words. Another participant of that meeting, in your memory or your, rather your research served you right, uh, was indeed Heng Samrin. And um, according to Ben Kiernan, at least, he, uh, Heng Samrin had a importantly different reading of the facts. And here I come to the uh, quotation on page 57, and it's a paragraph that starts with Heng Samrin, and I'll read. Heng Samrin, then studying military affairs under Sun Sen, was also at the meeting. He recalls the use of yet another term. They did not say kill. They said scatter the people of the old government. Scatter, or komchat, them away. Don't allow them to remain in the framework. It does not mean smash, komtek. Smash means kill, 
but they used a general word, scatter. Nguyen Chia used this phrase. This appears to be Sin Song's point number five, though the use of varied euphemisms is an important qualification. And of course, Professor Chandler, Chandler. Um, based on your knowledge of, of the language used in these DK era documents, would you agree with Heng Samrin that the use of the term scatter rather than to smash? is uh, relevant when uh, uh, studying this meeting, um, especially concerning TSM's adamant statement that this was a very important order to kill. Do you find it an important qualification like Ben Kennan does? Well, Well, it's certainly a contradiction uh, of information, and uh, I'm not in a position to say which one I believe. I have no access to the full text of the interviews. I haven't seen that word uh, to scatter used often in Khmer documents. Uh, he may well have used this word, uh, and the memory of the man who says he did might be accurate. It seems to me the, these two... <laughs> Uh, High-ranking uh, uh, officials should have been on the same page, but they uh, don't seem to have been. They have very sharp, different memories. They obviously weren't in the same room when Ben was interviewing them, but uh, I think it's very interesting that uh, Heng Samrin didn't agree, but I, I can't you know, prefer his testimony because I, I'm not in a position to take a side on it. But it would seem to me that a big meeting that included the five or six kind of point, the six points we're talking about wouldn't have used a more, slightly more genteel word like scatter because that was already taking place. That was already, they'd been scattered already. That was sent to the countryside. But that's not the word they usually use. They usually use chum to the countryside, not, not, not scattered. Okay. So, you know, I can't take a side on this. And this brings me to um, the next topic, which is a bit uh, later in time. And, uh, it is uh, 1977 that we are speaking about, and I would like to um, quote from a, uh, excerpt from uh, Brother Number One, your own book. And, um, again, it's been discussed, and I will proceed by reading the quote. And if I propose that you have questions on the quote, I can provide you with a copy. And I quote on page uh, 117 to 118 of uh, Brother Number One. The situation deteriorated in 1977 when thousands more starved to death while others became ineffective because of illness and insufficient food. Reports of these conditions took time to reach the higher organization, and since disagreement with the organization amounted to treason, the reports were never critical of the plan or its framework. Instead, the news transmitted up the line was always good, causing false optimism at the top, even as rice production faltered and rural workers died. And of course, Professor Chandler, based on your research, was there a practice among subordinates in the DK to uh, shield their superiors from information that their superiors would have found distasteful or problematic? And of course, there's a Yes, I think so. I mean, uh, certainly they were shielding themselves from any uh, criticism, trying to stay safe. There's evidence that they would uh, send seed and, uh, and uh, consumer rice 
up the line to show that they're producing surpluses which are not taking place. Uh, the regime, I think, if we've, I think it's become very clear over the last few days and also in many, many sources, had a very crowded work schedule. These people were jammed up with things they had to decide on. And conditions in the countryside, particularly among new people, was rather low on their list of priorities. Um, uh, and this information, did, accurate information, came to them very slowly. I think uh, Mrs. Hang uh, uh, went to the countryside and came back with some bad reports, but said to the, to the leadership that this must be the work of traitors rather than the plan. So this is one of the high-ranking people makes the same explanation. So, yeah, I mean, there's shielding all around. Everybody's uh, hiding bad news about themselves from people in, who then uh, punish them for, for this behavior or bad news. Thank you. I think that answers my question fully. So I can move on to the, uh, to the next topic. And I would like to um, put up a document uh, in your own work. It's, it's brother number one, document number E3, slash 17. And I would like to have a um, brief look at page 160 of that book and the English year-end for that passage is 0039374. Um, and Actually, as I see the passage, it's brief uh, enough and it's been working well. Uh, so I will just quote the passage uh, to you. Um, and I quote, perhaps 100,000 men and women, uh, and probably more, were executed without trial. In rural areas, most of the killings occurred when young cadres were forced, but they understood to be the will of the organization. Uh, some of these executions Perhaps most were impulsive over reactions. And of course, uh, on Friday, when preparing these questions, I did not process uh, Friday's transcript yet, but I will try to paraphrase you. Uh, spoke of executions in a hard way and snap decisions by enthusiastic, by enthusiastic cadre. Um, can you tell us a little bit about this topic, the, uh, what you call uh, impulsive overreactions and uh, snap decisions? Um, Uh, sure. <coughs> we now know that uh, probably many more than 100,000 people were executed and that the system of, uh, of prisons and uh, executions in the countryside is was more heavily documented than I knew at the time. Uh, but I still would stand by what I wrote in, uh, I guess it's the second edition, it's 1999, uh, that uh, a great deal of evidence has come down, particularly through interviews, of just the behavior of cadre in villages, impulsive, often uh, mysterious, uh, uh, chaotic, uh, but sometimes quite uh, organized and, and, uh, and always cruel, of course, but less uh, impulsive than that. It was only coming from orders from above or whatever, but the passage reflects lots of the information I got from over the years with many, many uh, Cambodian people I interviewed. <coughs> and certainly I should add, I'm sorry, certainly I should add, uh, never in the confessions of S21 did I read of someone uh, confessing to uh, impulsive behavior in the provinces. This was not the kind of crime that people confessed to. 
that indeed was going to be my um, follow-up question, Professor Chandler, whether you had any knowledge of to what extent the lower down, so to speak, would report ad hoc decisions and uh, impulsive overreactions to the people in the higher echelons. No, it, it wouldn't be in their interest, but I, I get back to something I said uh, last week, that in, I think, the uh, statutes of the Communist Party, or one of the other documents that we've uh, been consulting, uh, leftist deviation is in quotation marks. Rightist deviation is left as a fact, as the kind of thing that can be instantly recognized. So over enthusiastic uh, achievement of revolutionary goals, however vaguely uh, understood, was not systematically punished. Uh, the copy was given in some many cases uh, it's not a free reign they certainly uh, operated with impunity for for those activities now, many of these people came in uh, to s21 later uh, charged with being uh, agents and so on uh, they didn't confess to impulsive killings they confessed to systematic wrecking of the program in the countryside so we know these impulsive things took place, but they're not going to send news up to the, because the people at the top with it were not supposed to be impulsive, but you know, the news never went up there, I would guess. It's not the kind of thing you'd report, I don't think. I think that's, that's clear. And in, in, in that same context, I would like to um, show you a um, document, uh, an article by uh, Steve Heder. The title of the document is uh, Reassessing the Role of Senior Leaders and Local Officials in, in Credit Kampuchea Crimes. Um, Cambodian accountability in comparative perspective, and it is document number E190.1398, the English ERN is um, 00661455. And the French ERN is 00792913. To um, page 950. And I would like to show you an excerpt from page uh, 12 at this point. And that has English ERN 00661466. And uh, we have a hard copy for you available. And with your permission, President, um, I would like to show this on the screen.
And I um, think also judging from the uh, document number that it is part of the documents that were submitted by Kirsten Pan to be put uh, before the chamber, that's what's the E190.1.398 number suggests to me. So I don't want to misinform you, but in my best understanding, it should be uh, admissible for these two reasons. អនុញ្ញាតឲ្យដាក់ដេញដល់ក្នុងករណីនេះគឺ <coughs> Professor Chandler, those are three pages from the same article, and I will now be speaking only about page 12, which should be the first page in your uh, in, in your, uh, collection. And I will quote Steve Hedder where he speaks about killings, um, and I quote, but other killings, probably most, were committed by regional and the local authorities acting not as part of such a tight chain of command, but of a looser, more diffuse hierarchical structure of delegated and discretionary authority in which the top provided only vague and general guidelines, giving wide latitude to the lower downs, all the way to the bottom to decide who was and who was not an enemy and what to do with them. These lower downs were certainly uh, not just following orders. Would you agree with this characterization by uh, Steve Hedder? Yes, I would. I'm sorry, maybe I should have asked a uh, different question first. Are you familiar with this article that may inform our understanding today? Yes, I am. And the second excerpt I would like to show you from the same article is on page 21. And the English ERN for that page is 00661475. And I will quote, it seems that most commonly, however, people arrested in villages were sent to district security for interrogation, and although the district answered to the sector secretary, most prisoners were sooner or later executed on the authority of the district itself. This reflected the reality that zone and sec sector secretaries often merely pass passed, on the general passed on the general instructions from above to local cadre down to the district level, but paid little attention to whether they were doing what they were supposed to do or not. Mr. Chandler, would you, Professor Chandler, would you agree with this characterization by uh, Steve Hedder? Yes, I would. Um, and then on page two, Steve Hedder uh, discuss, discusses the uh, historical and legal model related to the genocide committed by the Nazis. And he uh, discusses this model and he writes, in short, the historical and legal model is a top-down conspiracy to commit genocide and other crimes against humanity. The targets, first of all, the big fish were presumed to be overwhelmingly responsible for most, if not all, of these crimes committed while they were in power. Mm, the end of, that's the end of the quote. 
um, for now. But let me ask you all uh, at this point, does this characterization by uh, Steve Heder of the historical legal model relating to uh, the Nazi genocide, does that remind you of the dominant narrative that we uh, discussed er earlier this morning, the, the dominant narrative relating to the uh, BK regime. Uh, yes, it does, but with a slight qualification, uh, I think this again I'm stating an opinion, but you've got to accept the idea that the top people were ultimately responsible for what was happening because they were in charge of the country. Uh, overwhelmingly, I think in this case is a word I wouldn't, I wouldn't if I, well, I I didn't write this passage, I wouldn't have used overwhelmingly. Uh, but yes, it reminds me of the other, but your, your question is quite, quite good, and quite clear, I mean. And as a historian, I'm um, let me rephrase that. Um, are you satisfied that enough historical research has been conducted as to the responsibility of people in the DK regime that were at a lower status than, let's say, the Central or Standing Committee. Let me phrase the question like this at first. Yeah, so, sorry, I, I, I meant to say that I had phrased the question as, uh, as such. Are you satisfied that from a historical perspective that enough <coughs> scholarly research has been done with regard to the responsibility of people lower than top national leaders of the DK regime? Well, in a sense, you're, I'm never sure of what's enough. And, and here is an area I don't really want to venture into because it seems to me that a great deal of the research that's been done uh, recently on this issue was in connection with cases that are not being tried or going to be, perhaps, I don't know, that are cases beyond the case under discussion. So, I mean, enough if uh, it's not for me to enter into the business of the court, but let's just assume for that this case, these other cases will go forward. Then you will have more research, and in some case you might reach what would be considered by, say, the prosecution enough for an indictment. But if the case, this, this kind of research is impossible to carry out without some sort of uh, mandate. You can't wander into the countryside and, and find this material out. Uh, so we have a lot of material uh, on, this, on these uh, lower down activities and lower down uh, behavior. A lot of it is not uh, able to be discussed here. A lot of it is not open uh, to uh, scrutiny. Uh, and so from an independent historian's point of view, I say, no, it's not enough because it's not in the open record. But it's uh, a lot more is known about this behavior now than was known when I was writing uh, my own books. And uh, that's why I was agreeing earlier with these uh, Steve Hedder statements, which were drawn from his own very extensive research long before he had anything to do with the, uh, with the tribunal. So he, he made those conclusions early on the basis of extensive research. So I'll, I'll leave it at that. 
thank you, Professor Chandler. And just to be absolutely clear, I don't ask you to uh, opine on anything that, that relates to the tribunal as such. I am asking you for your opinions as a historian. And, um, something that you just mentioned um, attracted my attention and I would like to ask something more about this. You state that this information uh, that you might be looking at is not something that is part of an open record, if I may, if I wrote down your words correctly. Could you elaborate on that for us? Not really. A lot of this stuff is draft material that I've seen that has not yet been published, but it's not classified by any authority. Uh, uh, so I can't uh, elaborate that much further of that. There is uh, certainly ample uh, material at the Archives of DC CAM that point toward these, uh, these activities also if one were to do a sustained research in there. Um, a problem, of course, that arises, as you see from the footnotes to Header's work, uh, is that a great deal of this organizational information comes out of confessions. And I know that he has argued uh, he told me anyway, I'm not sure where he wrote it down, that he feels strongly that this organizational material deserves to be included as, as uh, yeah, in official documents because you find out who was in command of places. And it, that's verifiable information that you could finally dig up. But, you know, it's not... Uh, I'll stop there. And... I understand you don't want to speculate on Steve Hedder's uh, research, so I will not ask you to, but um, has Steve Hedder told you or do you have any uh, reason to believe, other reasons to, to believe to know where this um, organizational material that Steve Hedder speaks about is located? Well, it's located, I just mentioned, it's located primarily in confessions of Tull Slang. This is where the information has been drawn. If you look at his footnotes, this is where he's got his material, plus from extensive interviews, two places. But are you familiar or are you aware of any research that Steve Hedder has conducted in this, into this topic after the publication of this paper? <laughs> not specifically. I've, I've read his published material. I have not. I've read some unpublished material, but not much. Uh, you know, I can't. That's my answer to that. Um, in that same Steve Hedder article on uh, page two, uh, I will, if it can be shown on the screen again, it's again the article by Steve Hedder um, that we were discussing earlier. And I quote um, Steve Hedder document. This chapter argues that this approach has misappropriately dominated the historical and legal approaches to the massive murders committed in, in democratic Cambodia under the rule from 7 April 1975 to 7 January 1979 of the Communist Party of Cambodia and efforts to bring those responsible for these murders to justice. The only single volume history of DK uh, and recently republished the Pol Pot regime Raise power and genocide in Cambodia and in Khmer Rouge strains to make the DK case analogous to a totalitarian and intentionalist and thus implicitly Nazi-like genocide. He advocates that Pol Pot and his leading associates should be held accountable for CPK crimes, which he say resulted from an explosive combination of totalitarian political ambition and a 
racialist project of ethnic purification, but does not mention accountability for lower And I think you partly answered this question already in your earlier comments, but Steve Heder takes issue with this failure of this, um, let's say, the omission by Ben Kiernan of uh, accountability for lower downs in uh, his volume, the Pol Pot regime. Do you share uh, Steve Heder's view that that is uh, an important omission, omission if one wants to understand the DK regime? I the three three word answer is uh, yes I do but it's a complicated question and, and one that we have to expand out into other areas but certainly what you're hearing here in the Kiran book and one of the reasons I uh, took a little bit of issue with it when I reviewed it was that making this uh, making racism the essence of the entire regime as opposed to aspects of certain periods in the regime seem to be a bit of a stretch, and this is why uh, Heder uses the word strange. And I think he's trying to move uh, back into something that an indictment, uh, an, in, an informal indictment, a, a historical indictment, not very far different from the one uh, raised at the uh, 1979 trial, which doesn't seem to me to be to, uh, uh, be a fair, uh, an accurate assessment of what went on under, under DK, unless you're talking about the single man at the top is, in fact, uh, you know, uh, not overwhelmingly responsible as before, but, but uh, ultimately responsible. But that's, uh, that doesn't get you very far in terms of studying what's happening. So I think this uh, paragraph of Hedders is uh, quite justified. Um, you are an historian, and we've been speaking about context several times today, and my question to you is, um, do you think that events and political realities that have occurred after the fall of the DK regime color or influence the way we look at the quote-unquote facts of this case today? That's inevitable. That's the way people operate. I mean, we're operating in terms of the testimony of last week. I mean, we benefited from that. We, did, we have a different, I think, maybe context today than we had on last Wednesday. This, but I'm not boasting that this is clear. To, I'm not saying that. But it's just this is how people operate with the information they have. And as you go on, uh, once a regime has fallen, uh, you, the information becomes available that was not available before. This is a very secretive regime. Uh, you have to be very cautious in sorting out the information you get, uh, looking out for easy uh, exits like uh, the Pol Pot Young Street genocidal clique, or uh, exits that suggest that uh, the uh, top officials knew nothing about this, so therefore the tr the, they shouldn't be here. Uh, but as time goes on, and one wishes in a way that we were 10 years ago when information was fresher, but as time goes on, you find out more and more detail that, that encourages us to make uh, uh, more nuanced judgments. And this is, I think, uh, what makes history an evolving thing. You can't write 
the last word. I can say I've written my last book, but that's not the last word. That'll be by somebody else. I think that makes a lot of sense, um, Professor Chantar. Um, and in that context, um, could you elaborate a little bit on the political um, coloring of the uh, party that took over power after 1979 and how that political coloring uh, may have dominated the dominant narrative that we have been discussing. And I'm asking you this as a historian, not as a uh, legal scholar, obviously. Your Honours, we would object to this question, political colouring or otherwise by uh, regimes subsequent uh, to the DK is, is not relevant for the purposes of um, Professor Chandler's testimony. What we're interested in is Professor Chandler's expert opinion on the events and authority structures of 75 to Merci, Monsieur le Président. Non, seul, euh, non seulement cette question est orientée, mais de surcroît, elle est hors contexte, puisqu'elle se situe après 79. Et si l'on fait référence à l'expérience d'historien, ça implique de faire euh, référence à des documents qui seraient ou des euh, faits postérieurs à 79. To respond to that, Mr. President, there was a reason why I asked Professor first whether he was of the opinion that events that took place after the uh, fall of the DK regime could influence the way we perceive facts at this moment. And the professor has answered from a historical perspective, yes, he can, if I may par paraphrase the professor, and he can correct me if I'm wrong. We're talking here about the facts of this case. We have heard earlier today and last week testimony of the culling of evidence by the Vietnamese. The PRK regime um, may or may not have been involved. This, and this is uh, implicit in the question. This may or may not have been a result of the political coloring of uh, the PRK regime and its history. And Professor Chandler is an expert on the history of Cambodia. He knows a whole lot about uh, the history of the CPK. And I would like to have Professor Chandler's historical opinion, no more than that, on how um, um, or whether or not he is of the opinion that these facts have been colored by uh, later, uh, the later regime that was put in place or took over power, depending on who you ask, after um, the DK regime fell. So I think it's clearly relevant. It relates to history, and we are here to ask Professor Chandler to uh, explain Cambodian history to us. And I think I for sure need some. ការពីក្តីក្រុមដំណាងដើមដឹងរាប់វិនីគឺអង្គជម្រះមិនអនុញ្ញាតឲ្យលោកឆ្លើយតបទៅនឹងសេចក្តីតបរបស់ភាគី
สมนูนี่มันเปียกปอนตีให้ก็ขมิ้นมูลฐานสมอ้างเจียฉบับได้คือจิกาสู้ดอยกาปันสมานตอลอัตโนมัติตอลขลุ่นบนนอกสะใสลูกเนี่ยจุ่มนี้มันจะไปชอยตอบแต่หนังสมนูจงกร้อยระบอกมีแต่วิกาเปียกได้ลูกนุนชี้อนิตีสมเชยลูกไม่เคยกันหรอวะ Thank you, Mr. President. And good morning, Mr. President. Good morning, Your Honors, and good morning to everyone in and around the courtroom. I just wish to supplement that if the dominant narrative that has emerged as a result of the coloring and may have impacted on the way certain witnesses may have provided evidence. Ong yom reh samrat panyha ni ruhi hai. Dechne ong yom reh mana anyat ay lok ni ye panyha to dail ni titi mien panyha thamai tip ong yom reh anyat. Ông Mẹ Phật Đạo Bị Tư Ca Chúng Tư Cô Mẹ Tư Vì Ca Bị Cái Đây Lúc Nguồn Chìa If I may just one second Mr. President I was merely Ông Nhâm Rẹp Mân Anh Nhà Tí Pà Nhà Hà Rồi Đáy Ông Nhâm Rẹp Bàn Sầm Rạch Rụi Hời Ông Nhâm Rẹp Mân Phật Đạo Bị Tư Ca Ây Lúc Nhi Dây Pà Nhà Hà Tà Đáy Đáy Ông Nhâm Rẹp Bàn Sầm Rạch Rụi Hời Tì Chìa Ca Cũng Khan Đã Phê Vì Lìa Nây Cách Âm Nà Ca Sạ Mân Nà Ca I'm not trying to dwell on the topic. I'm trying to bring to your attention and to your colleagues' attention that we have the right to make a record. We're not one group here. I represent a different community. Thank you, Mr. President. And, um, I respect your ruling that I'm not um, allowed to ask the question I just posed, but I would um, like to have a recent decision on the objections by the prosecution and civil parties because, again, for Record-keeping purposes, we know we need to know what the reasons are for uh, your decision to not allow this question. So, uh, it will also help me to formulate um, my next uh, round of questions. So, if you could give assistance. ดำนางสาบีญ้าหนึ่งมีตวีดำนำนมกดำนางเดิมมาดังรอดแบบนี้มีดประสิทธิภาพสำนัวได้ลูกสัวคือตีมุ้ยครองให้ตีปีมันมีนพอตังนามุ้ยในเดิมจมูกเนี่ยจมเนี่ยนี่อันปีปัญหาได้ลูกสัวได้ปันสมานนุตีลูกมันมันบังอ้อบังฮาอย่างปีพอตังเอาไว้เฉลี่ยและหรือปัญหานี่ตีเอาอย่างเรียบบ้านสำหรับจะรู้เฮย That makes it clearer, Ms. President. Um, thank you. That also helps me to formulate my next question. Um, reference to um, what I would say, pinpointing and referring to specific documents. Uh, Professor Chandler, you, um, when you spoke about the culling, you spoke about. Um, Vietnam's reasons for uh, doing so. As we discussed, the PRK uh, officials uh, may or may not have been involved in this. You were not entirely clear. But my question to you is, do you think that the culling of the evidence that has come out of the um, VK regime was influenced by the political coloring of the PRK. Your Honours, we would have.
ហើយនៅក្នុងសាភិញ្ញាវិទ្យាលយ៉េពាក្យថាបំបាត់ឬក៏ប្លែកឯកសារនេះជាទូទៅដែលព្រោះនឹងសូវ៉ាតិចេស
บาร์กปีพิษาในขนมจากกรมซาในองค์ยิมเรห์องค์ยิมเรห์ยุลเคยทาเดิมไปเอาชบัลล์เลยไปปัญหานี่ก็ไปเอาลูกเนจุมนิงชลอยโตเป็นหนึ่งสมนูได้ซูจงกรอยได้มีตวีอันตรายที่กาปิกได้ลูกนุ่นชี้ผู้สันบาขนงเนียมลูกสัตถาชาชีเนจุมนิงประวัติศาสตร์น้องอาชลอยเจ้าชบัลต์เป็นหนึ่งโตเป็นหนึ่งสมนูในบ้านให้องค์ยมเรศปัตสัยจะเลยสกัดจุมตัวระบบกรมกรมนางสาปริยะหนึ่งมีตวีนมกกรมนางดังดังรอบรอบปีนี้สมเกลุกตาตาจ้าอาจลอยตอบแต่หนึ่งสมนูได้สู้จงกรอยได้เมตตวีอันตรายที่กาบิกระไดลูกนุ่นจีเชื่อมใจบาดเชื่อมหนึ่งเชื่อเลยเชื่อมใจบาดเชื่อมหนึ่งเชื่อเลยเชื่อมใจบาดเชื่อมหนึ่งเชื่อเลยเชื่อมใจบาดเชื่อมหนึ่งเชื่อเลยเชื่อมใจบาดเชื่อมหนึ่งเชื่อเลยเชื่อมใจบาดเชื่อมหนึ่งเชื่อเลยเชื่อมใจบาดเชื่อมหนึ่งเชื่อเลยเชื่อมใจบาดเชื่อมหนึ่งเชื่อเลยเชื่อมใจบาดเชื่อมหนึ่งเชื่อเลยเชื่อมใจบาดเชื่อมหนึ่งเชื่อเลยเชื่อมใจบาดเชื่อมหนึ่งเชื่อเลยเชื่อมใจบาดเชื่อมหนึ่งเชื่อเลยเชื่อมใจบาดเชื่อมหนึ่งเชื่อเลยเชื่อมใจบาดเชื่อมหนึ่ง Case one, when uh, when the lawyers for asked me what material was in uh, the undiscovered archives, I had to reply that it was difficult to tell what material was in the undiscovered archives. I'd be as polite as I could. Same thing here. We don't know where these documents went. We don't know which documents disappeared. We don't know what was in them. We don't know why, if they were called, they were called. I think we can make a supposition that as the Vietnamese obviously went through many of the materials at S21, and probably other materials that we don't know that for sure, they took out some materials that did not seem to them to meet their interests. Uh, at the time, so much surprise, so much material survived uh, about the DK regime uh, that we were able here to speak uh, with, uh, you know, some documentary authority. Uh, I don't want to get into the uh, culling issue too deeply. I think, uh, as Edgar said, it, but what was we don't know if some things were removed, burnt by the DK people themselves, uh, disappeared, and are, are to and are locked up somewhere. I can't say answer these questions. So I, I mean, I don't know where uh, the questions are going to go, and I, of course, I'm here to answer questions. But I'm not prepared to go in much further into this issue. ในจับปีนี้ตัวเต้าโดดดอมมองมุ้ยสามสิบนาทีรัสเซียนี้สมัครเชิญโจวิ่งทำไมเป็นโตเกจมนาการสามนาการในประบาตลาการตลอดมู
กอบอภัยสตัวจบประกอบสตัวสำหรับจุดจับจับตรงนี้อาจารย์รานกิจจำนากาสำนากาปีจุงไงปีประตูมวยเถื่อนกรมซาสำนากานี่นงเยาปีในกิจจำนากาสำนากาในรัสเซียนี่ให้ประกอบอภัยอนุเรียมันที่คงแข้งนองคลุนจุดจับจับตรงนี้หนึ่งคือสมพรตะการประตูขังกรมซาสำนากานี่ได้ในรัสเซียนี่ตกเอาไอ้ลุงตรงนี้เดี๋ยวขนมตุ๊บได้เรียบจอมตุ๊กที่ใส่เดี๋ยวประกอบสตูสำหรับกดอาจารย์ร้านกิจจำนากาสำนากาปีจุงไงได้ไล่ลูกเชื่อสมพรไอ้น้องพลุงกดลาวมกันประตุสำนากาวิ้งไอ้บานมนเมามุยสามสิบนาทีเรื่อยๆสำหรับเจ้า